cloud and mute all and Mark Vincennes, you have the floor. Thank you, thank you. And welcome to episode 67 of Lip Balm. Um, today we have a, a, a very special feature, the women of Hanging Loose Press. Uh, and our readers are Jiwan Choi, Linda Norton, Caroline Haggard, and Joanna Thurman, who will be introduced uh, by, by their the editor uh, at Hanging Loose, Mark Polak. Um, uh, but before we get to that, uh, we'll do our uh, customary um, short reading to warm up the mic for you guys. And I'm going to first uh, introduce my co-host, Jonathan Penton, who founded Unlikely Stories in 1998. Uh, that's an electronic journal of literature and art. Since then, he's led his editorial management assistance to a number of literary and artistic ventures, such as Mad Hat, the New Orleans Poetry Festival, Rigorous, and Big Bridge. In 2005, he founded Unlikely Books, which publishes three to five poetry books a year. He's organized literary performances and performed himself across the United States. His poetry books are Last Chap, Blood and Salsa, and Painting Rust, Prosthetic Gods, and Standards of Sanity, um, and the free chat book Backstories, which you can download from Archivist eBooks. Jonathan. Thank you, Mark. So as the regulars have heard me say many times, I'm not very prolific. So what I do most weeks is I warm up the mic by reading something we've published recently at unlikelystories.org. And this week I'd like to read to you a prose poem. It's called As for the Worm, and it's by Toby Hiller. <clears throat> Excuse me. As for the worm, it inches. The orangutan, on the other hand, scratches, thinking of a joke involving a burlap bag, the people watching him, and his own head. But not only the snake slithers. The press conference will be at 10 a.m. Words fill the air like crows looking for the nearest edible morsel or gnats seeking out the liquid refreshment of a deer's eyes. I mean, it's words. Is that nature? We're better than the other animals at it. Wolf, wolf, the story goes, and then stockpiled guns in the garage. In the slam pong blare of question and answer, you can hear a low dangerous buzz, electric as the crackle of insects frying against a light bulb. Next is a silence in which water boils. It is a moment of urgency for the water, as the poet says. Love, too, may be like that. War? Nothing stops, only changes shape, velocity, or trajectory. From point to cluster, from liquid to ice, from possible to rifle, from perhaps to hope. These possibilities fly everywhere of all stripes and fancies. The long march towards the mountains you are dreaming of, or the place you never wanted to go, has already begun. Again, that was by Toby Hiller of UnlikelyStories.org. All right, next up, let's hear from our co-host, Cassandra Atherton. Cassandra is an award-winning writer, scholar of prose poetry, and professor of writing and literature in Melbourne. Her most recent books of prose poetry are Pre-Raphaelite, Leftovers, and Fugitive Letters. She is currently writing a book of prose poetry on the atomic bomb with funding from the Australia Council. I've seen it, it's wonderful. Cassandra co-wrote Prose Poetry, an Introduction, and the Anthology of Australian Prose Poetry. She is commissioning editor for Westerly Magazine. Cassandra, will you read for us today? I would love to. Um, of course, I have a prose poem today because that's all I write, uh, prose poems. And this one's called Sand. When you promise we can have sex on the beach, I'm disappointed you meet a cocktail at the Empire Diner. Even with peach snaps, it's hardly a substitute for wet sand on the backs of my thighs or the slow scrunching of a bright beach towel under my hips. As we stroll through Chelsea on our way to 10th Avenue, you mourn the absence of laundromats and cheap Chinese restaurants pointing out the high lu luxury high rises where the working class apartments were. We fall silent. You are remembering your teenage treks through this place and I'm contemplating dirty yellow grains of sand imprinting strange patterns on my buttocks. The moon high, our time running out. And I would like to introduce Mark Vincennes. And I always say it's like karaoke bio note, join in where you can. 
Mark Vincennes is an Anglo-Swiss American poet, a fiction writer, a translator, editor, publisher, designer, multi-genre artist, and musician. He has published 15 books of poetry, including more recently, Becoming the Sound of Bees, Leaning into the Infinite, The Syndicate of Water and Light by Station Hill Press, Here Comes the Night Dust by Salmon Poetry, and Einstein Fledermouse from Sir Vision Books. Vincenzo's newest collection, The Little Book of Earthly Delights, was just released from Spite and Dival. An album of music, ambience, and verse, Left Hand Clapping, is forthcoming from Tree Torn Records. Vincenzo is also a prolific translator, and he's translated from German, Romanian, and French. He's published 10 books of translations, most recently Unexpected Development by award-winning Swiss poet and novelist Klaus Mertz with White Pine, and it was a finalist for the 2016 Cliff Becker Book Prize in Translation. His translation of Mertz's selected poems in Audible Blue is forthcoming from White Pine Press in the fall, so grab one. Vincennes is editor and publisher of the splendid Mad Hat Press and publisher of the esteemed New American Writing. He's lived all over the world from, you remember, Brazil to China, to Iceland, to India, but he now lives on a farm in rural Western Massachusetts, overlooking Herman Melville's Greylock Mountain and where, I know you're wondering what he's put in this week, there are more bald-faced hornets, mud daubers, and northern leopard frogs than people. It was not disappointing. Mark, will you please read for us? Thank you, Cassandra. Um, this is... Um from uh, my book uh, that I, I just recently finished called There Might Be a Moon or a Dog, uh, which has actually been accepted for publication um, from uh, Germondo in Australia. Um, but um, anyway, this section is called An Alphabet of Last Rites. And um, I won't go through the whole alphabet, don't worry. Um, and by the way, there are a few sort of side journeys outside the alphabet. Uh, I'm just going to give you a, a couple of these short, short ones. A. The fingers, the soft fingers, almost transparent, abandoned, but not cold. A burst, a flurry, a flutter, not unlike anything, any lukewarm harvest you might feed me. B. The hair in curls and folds, that curlicue on your forehead like some 20s flapper dancer, how the curl returns after all these years and the rice on your chin, all the Chinese you ever wished for, gong hei fat choi, sweet fingers. You were all I could have ever wished for. It curls and folds and doubles up and flies away the distant cities of the lone crow crossing the cloud bank. C, a word in your ear, please. If all we ever found here were fool's gold, but for heaven's sake, get dressed. We can't have people seeing you like that. We might, they might think ourselves clever. The eyes are dizzied by some unseen fortune. The starling lifts a silver ring with a 24 karat diamond and thinks it's a hard nut. D. And in the folds and creases, much as ironed out, no doubt, all those creams you applied in your lifetime and the ointments and the multivitamins and the extra collagen and calcium, the cabbage eaten every Sunday, the right light three times a day. When the moon was full, you said one hour would give you years of wrinkle-free skin. It worked. E. The country we're supposed to be headed for is rich in mineral resources and cheap labor. The country we're coming from is rich in the middle where all the girth accumulates. It hits you in the teeth when you walk out the door. Never forget, though, the last words are inevitably the second to go. F. Always with the neck extended, as if the last leaf were always the best. A long road rambles within us. G, an extended metaphor like the one I'm using now has to have teeth and flesh. The tiger pacing the millionaire's pool in Bangladesh, for example, and the blood in her whiskers, a sneak peek of early evenings in your swimsuit, martini in hand, your hair wrapped up in a towel turban, and later, the obligatory kaftan, the silver pumps, that once belonged to Eva Perón. Anyone can be an actress, you once said, but few have become a dictator. Thank you. Uh, now I'm going to introduce Mark Pollock, um, who is the uh, editor of, uh, one of the editors of uh, Hanging Loose Press, and is the author of nine poetry collections, 
and the other editor of six anthologies, most recently Reconnaissance, New and Selected Poems and Poetic Journals. Uh, Mark's newest book forthcoming in the fall from Mad Hat Press is a literary memoir, My Deniversity, Knowing Denise uh, Levitov. Um, Mark's poems and prose will be translated into German, Japanese, Spanish, and Polish, and he's performed at Teatre Polski in Warsaw. For the past 40 years, he's been co-editor at the Brooklyn, New York-based poetry journal and literary press Hanging Loose. Um, to support his writing habits, he teaches mathematics at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. He lives in Cambridge, um, and Mark will, will take our feature from here. Welcome. Mark, I completely forgot to unmute you while Mark was talking. I'm sorry. Okay, there you go. There we go. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, and uh, yeah, so uh, Bob Hershon, our other our co editor who just uh, passed away this spring, uh, jokingly would often refer to me as the as the kid editor because I'd only been with the press 40 years since uh, he and Dick Lurie and, uh, and other deceased editors just founded Hanging Loose in 1966. So this is our 55th year of continuous running. Uh, so I, I, it makes me think of the, uh, you know, the, the Dylan song, uh, Maggie's Farm, you know, 20 years of schooling and they put you on the day shift. So I, I've moved to the day shift now. Um, so this is a delight to uh, be celebrating uh, four, uh, uh, four of our uh, authors, all women. Uh, and you know, the title of this reading is uh, Women Poets of uh, Writers of Hanging Loose. I have to say that uh, I went through our, our back, our, our, our list of titles and book titles, and I came up and I, I'm not sure I have a complete list here but I came up with 34 women authors that Hanging Loose has published books by. Uh, so in addition to the four readers tonight and Carrie Smith who couldn't join us, uh, last year we uh, had a, a book out by Wang King. Uh, we've published, and, and I, I should add that many of these books were first books, which is something Hanging Loose is very proud of doing, is publishing the first books by many authors. Miko Han, Maggie Nelson, Eula Biss, Kathy Park Hong, M.L. Smoker, Poet Laureate of uh, Montana, Yolanda Wisher, a former Poet Laureate of Philadelphia, Joan Larkin, Jane Cortez, Hetty Jones, Jenny Olin, Beth Bosworth, Sharon Mesmer, Helen Adam, going way back, Roland Elizabeth McDaniel, deceased, uh, who was the Poet Laureate of Tulare County, California, uh, a farm worker family, Carol Bernstein, who's here with us, Eleanor Nowen, Marie Carter, Maureen Owen, Elizabeth Suedos, deceased, Donna Brook, Jen Benka, Patricia Traxler, Roz Blackenbur Brackenbury, Jan Clausen, Kathy Cockrell, Marie Harris, and I'm sure there's a few I've, I've, I've forgotten. So we're, we're very proud of, uh, you know, our, our track record with it supporting women writers and, uh, and they're just a terrific, terrific bunch. Um, so I'm gonna start because Carrie Smith uh, was called in by her unscrupulous boss to work uh, in the bar today and couldn't, couldn't be with us. So I picked one of her poems. Uh, this is her collection dragging anchor uh, that was published by Hanging Loose a few years ago. It was her first book. It's called Only Human. A guy passed me on the street, but waited until I had passed before he said hello. And I didn't respond. Hurt, he said, hey, I am a human. And yes, honey, you are. But you're going the wrong way down Tompkins Avenue into the sunshine under the green summer trees and it's five o'clock on your day off probably. And I'm human too, but heading to work where last week one of my managers made me cry for whatever misstep or miscalculation and where for the next six to eight hours, I'll think about how my career hasn't started yet. But I, if I'm lucky, I could work for at least 40 more years or something, literally anything else but this thing that I'm 
on my way to do. So hello, keep going your own way into the afternoon. Get an ice cream cone for me. Sit in the shade somewhere, continue to be human. Maybe take the train down to Coney Island, fall in love, brace yourself for the next few years or just July. Thought that would be an appropriate uh, carry poem for, <laughs> for the occasion of being called into work. Uh, so it's my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Jiwon Choi. Uh, Jiwon is a poet, early childhood educator, and urban gardener. She works with children and teachers uh, on developing emergent curriculum at the Education Alliance, uh, a multi generational nonprofit. She's the author of two poetry collections, both from Hanging Loose. Uh, One Daughter is Worth Ten Sons, and I Used to Be Korean. She lives in Brooklyn, and I'm going to hold up her two books. So her first book, One Daughter is Worth Two Sons, and the brand new, I Used to Be Korean. About, uh, about this new book, uh, Terence Winch wrote, these sharp tongue poems often levitate on their own buoyant wit, are full of Jiwan's delightful, quote, wickedness and dirty humor. Her work is propelled by New York immigrant energy, which of course makes it quintessentially American. So Jiwan Choi. Thank you. Thanks for that great intro. Um, I'm gonna start with some poems from the new collection. Thank you, Lip Balm, for uh, hosting us, Mark, Cassandra, and uh, Jonathan. Super. Cinnamon toast. Buttering those thin slices to the brink of destruction, bedazzling with sugar and cinnamon, shellacking fingers and teeth are lubricated lips, kissing in your white kitchen before your mother gets home while our grammar homework gets cold. I'm gonna read two Rockaway poems. Uh, this is the newer of the two. It's called Rockaway Diary, 1986. Your Father in Heaven, Bella Lugosi incarnate, all forehead, leering around corners, lingering under the stairway. His penchant for culverts puts him in the order of miscreant. Mother coffee tea clutching her once white mug, right on cue, 6 a.m. She begins her search for the milk. Will she remember to look behind the pickles and the sunny D? Olivia's boyfriend. Goatee, almost 30. He's known her since she was eight. Takes notice now that she's a head taller than him. No one is appalled. Your pa's dead and your ma's on the couch again. Sandbar. I like to tell how we were nearly lost at sea, forgetting that Poseidon must not be trusted. He will catch you up in his folds of bleak water and the shape shifting sand meant to fool us into thinking it's land, but no, it's not on the lifeguard chair, your wild heart crashing into me like the sea. I am drowning in your Irish promise. Wild whistle. You grow where not can, cracking through rock to reach the sun. When did you become that craggy old man pushing up to the counter to order your coffee and two eggs on a roll? The older Rockaway poem is from the first book and it is titled, All Roads Lead to Rockaway Beach, 143rd. You can tell I spent a lot of time on Rockaway Beach when I was younger. All Roads Lead to Rockaway Beach, 143rd. One, Arch Angel of Neponset. Sorry, Archangel of the B-list God wears his crown, hard one, and aluminum to let me know his lineage of whiskey in the jarro 
compels him to pick an Irish rose, one of those girls who ruled his schnapps fueled nights of 1984, dancing topless around bonfires and mistaking planes for stars. I wish on these same imposter stars one by one, willing the night sky to swallow me whole. Two, she. She grew up tall and translucent, singing along with the North Sea. Chanties of men carved from stone and women a wings, wondering if she should check for a knot where scapulars used to be. Black Irish glow in the dark, she leaves off the light when she puts her face to the mirror to pick at the spot on her chin that has nothing to do with beauty. She was five. When she got, it wasn't coming off, no matter how hard she rubbed or plucked. Was it a mark left by the devil? Or an, by the devil's quill or an angel's pen? It is the randomness that keeps her up at night. Three, in Korean years, five of mine to one of yours is what it will take to get over you, to get your ocean out of my nose and ears and get my eyes to blacken your skies blue. You are my pirate on land in your Gaelic house, tart with wenches, sloppy with first mates. We walk the plank to splinters, my bonnie boy of the Northeast Swampland. You are the last stone I can't shake out of my shoe, but you let me leave with the limp not entirely free. Do you ever think of me? Send me a signal, a drunken gull, a lonely pigeon with a note tied around her flank, or the least you can do is shove a piece of paper in an empty bottle. I'm gonna read a, a sort of a New York poem um, just because I think Joanna was letting you know that we did the uh, small book flea this afternoon and it was really stupendous. Um, this poem is called Rat One. He appears a shrunken pony, easing passage across asphalt plains and concrete tundras into the green flash of the setting sun. Two, our dead lie in their eternal hour sod coming out of every orifice. What do plastic flowers matter to a child who died, not yet weaned from his mother's teat? Rats underground empire is bones, gnawed free from old men and new babies. The pharaohs had their stones, but rat has our bones. Three, rat finds her inside a rib cage, rustling in parcels of quarter cobs, half bagels and tomatoes, he is smitten. Consummation should be easy as eating a chicken wing and sipping on beer, but not so fast, buddy. She makes him promise not to let the jib get away from the boat. Four, tossed over a garden fence, your tail twitching alive with black ants. Um, I'm going to read a new poem. Maybe I'll read, uh, depending on time, I'll read one or two. Um, this is uh, very new, um, but I'm happy to share it with you. Um, it is called Sunny Stick Plays Bird. Sunny Stick Plays, now's the time and you believe you can fly. You have discovered the magic flute to propel you, cut through the tightened seal that is time and space. You can transverse the complications of your diminution here. What your imagination will not allow, your body memory will take hold so that you may realize that you were of wings after all, riding the north wind across these hemispheres, making the seasons, Guadalajara, Lima, 
Saginaw, Detroit, come embody light. Do I have time for one more? Okay. Yeah. okay, so this is also a newish poem. It is called Good Crows. Isn't it usually the blackbirds, perhaps crows, who can first when death is near? Is the reaper of souls sending advance notice, speed dialing from the other side? Or perhaps they just smell the musky shrouds approach. Do we say it is so because crows are the most boisterous? But what about us, the blue jays will insert. What about them indeed? Watch them work to impress upon you their glorious ruckus, no matter who's awake or not. And wouldn't you be tempted to agree? But the reaper does not call upon them. No, they are too cheerful in their blue tuxedos and mullet top hats, too charming. They are a flight of ideas and jaunty cacophony. They are no harbingers of sorrow. Good crows, thank you for your signal for us to take our last breath before we get stamped, return to sender. That's great. great. Wonderful. Great. Thank you, G1. Wonderful. So uh, Joanna Furman uh, has uh, has just come in from the All Star Game and is uh, is going to be subbing for uh, for us today. We're happy to have her. Uh, I wasn't prepared with a full biography, so I'm going to have to read from the back of her book, her new Hanging Loose title, which just came out a few months ago, To a New Era. Terrific collection. So Joanna is a native New Yorker, author of five previous full-length collections, four of them from Hanging Loose. She lives in Flatbush, teaches creative writing, and coordinates the introduction to creative writing program at Rutgers uh, in New Brunswick. Uh, I should add that uh, jo Joanna, like Caroline, uh, got their start uh, as high school students in, uh, in the Hanging Loose High School section and, and many, many, many years ago. <laughs> so another thing we're very proud of at Hanging Loose. Uh, Elaine Equi had this to say about this new collection, which is really ter a terrific book. This writing is resilient and exhilarating, showing swagger in the face of daunting odds. Read it for an infusion of satire, wit, and defiance as you grapple with our current version of everyday life to a new era. So, Joanna, take it away. Hi. I'm going to start with a poem that has an enjam title. So, the the first line is well, you'll figure, you'll see. I'll just read read it through. The cat we don't own sleeps on my chest and doesn't meow. Instead, it murmurs in the voice of my 81 year old mother who is stuck in a cardiac hospital thousands of miles away. Okay, I admit it's not my mom's actual voice. The sound the animal makes is part growl, part purr, part metallic laugh. It's not really a cat either. It's half cat, half miniature rhino. When I dream, the chimera enters my eye holes and crawls around, searching for a subway car with wings so we can fly together over the veins of highways and splotchy landfills. As my husband turns away, pulling the blanket towards him, I hold the not cat to my chest and I can hear my mother's heart under the animal's thick black fur. It's beating too fast, too irregular. So I know that it wants to escape its animal body, wants to stomp its feet in blood red flamingo shoes, wants to cry out, to borrow the sun's bullhorn, to scream at anyone who'll listen. Um, now I'm going to read a longer poem. It's a half crown of sonnets, um, loose sonnets. And the 
one of the sonnets you'll tell you can tell is in prose. Okay. Oh, and it's in conversation with Muriel Rukeyser. Um, so there's some quotes from Rukeyser's letters from the front um, within it. And it's it also starts with um, a quote from the New York Times, August 11th, 2017, which was uh, so it's the, right after the Unite the Right rally. Um, so the quote is, last night, several hundred torch-bearing men and women marched on the main quadrangle of the University of Virginia's ground shouting, you will not replace us and Jews will not replace us. And the poem is called, Muriel said that to be a Jew in the 20th century is to be offered a gift. We New York City kids always felt superior, but then you wake up and it's 2017 and suddenly I'm all jealous of the cold rocks under other people's feet. The kids who got the coolest bullies to sign their leg casts are now CEOs rewriting the meaning of cloud script. Resist, fail and resist. Mrs. Whitebread's been in the same hallway for 30 years, pretending we didn't see her crying behind the history textbook, triggered by the passage her family erased. So why not just fold your childhood into a terry cloth swan? Ignore the blobs of bubble wrap, dirty erasers, the mountains of cell batteries in a place whose name you can't pronounce. In a place whose name you can't you try to embrace the rage, the stone insanity with all its cracks, run into the crowded street, the bill of rights written on your ass and eyeliner, so the enemies you moon will finally understand the uses of free speech. Click, pause, reset. Become the anger you envy in other people. Ignore the paperwork, bills, piles of laundry, what color is the parachute of an airplane in flames? Your future career was meant to be an asteroid or telepathic frog. What happened? Your new password is fuck that. Your username is the memory of slavery, racism, loss. The memory of slavery, racism, loss is not the same as the feeling of remembering slavery, racism, loss. What you thought was the ghost of the 20th century is just a mustard yellow bikini top tied to a sunburnt toddler at the public pool in Park Slope, Evanston or Marin. So little is covered. So why is it still around? And who are we to complain? Former children to the accidents of privilege, born to families with two car garages, glass door bookcases and folk song packed grade school assemblies where white children sing songs about Rosa Parks. Is this what we thought democracy looked like? This is what we thought democracy looked like. Reading poetry in the sandbox, the ocean removing its rubber mask, revealing tongue shaped retractable blades. The kids books we read on our parents' faux Chinese sofas included details about charred bodies and lamps made from human skin. Dear reader, fill in the details of your own tragedy. History, please explain. How does comfort end and responsibility begin? Privilege, when will you flip over and let us listen to the B-side, the one where if you play it backwards, the present moment makes sense. But backwards, does the present moment make sense? At 18, I fell in love with an activist and we spent our days in the Texas heat, walking around parking lots with clipboards, gathering signatures for water regulation. I never completely believed in the reality of the world, felt more myself in the dissolving boundaries of de Kooning's blurry yellow even with clipboard in hand, did I have faith in my own relationship to the earth? I couldn't feel it. I didn't need to. I rented other people's passion. One evening, I borrowed a housemate's vase so my boyfriend could display the algae from the polluted lake to city council. A fancy vase was all she had, opaque orange glass with spider-like designs. 
I think it was from Pottery Barn. Of course, he lost the prop in the chaos of the hearing. My housemate was furious. I was working on an essay on dolls and Rilke and Juna Barnes that night, far from downtown. So I couldn't tell her where it had ended up. In the next day's Statesman, the story ended with a joke about the abandoned vase. No one could tell the reporter why that vessel was sitting on the floor. No one could tell the reporter why that vessel was sitting on the floor. Why was that vessel sitting on the floor? Are we the vase, the water, or the algae? The clouds and the towers are not enough to hide the country. We maybe always were or are. Here in this divided time, here in these conflicting signs, I watched the news in a small town hotel room on the way to visit my husband's Trump voting dad. On my laptop, a blurry photo of a young woman is holding up a handwritten sign. This is the moment Hebrew school prepared me for. And I think of Rukeyser's words, the gift is torment, but also full life. I'll just read a couple more. We were on the way to the protest march or brunch. When I say my tweet is a bullet headed straight to the heart of capitalism, who is wearing a frayed Cookie Monster costume stolen from a West Texas frat house. What I mean is the words are the net that keeps the acrobats from falling into the gaping mouths of the uncontrollable masses. And I think this is why when I think there is a possibility for instant change, the color of my sunset Bellini looks more sunrise, less sunset. The cafe's white painting is suddenly more Mallarmé, less architectural digest, 1986. So finally, um, I teach intro to creative writing. Now I teach the honor section, so all my students are wonderful, but I used to just teach the regular section and I'd often have these sort of frat boy kind of kids. And so anyway, this one semester, I would have like, a, I always have a section on surrealism and the some of the frat boys were really into surrealism that semester. And um, so I called it like the bro corner were really into surrealism. But anyway, so this is called bro realism in honor of them. <laughs> okay. They say inside each bro is a different identical bro. And inside that bro is the chicken that laid the egg that started the world. But dude, Where's your magnetic pocket knife? Your heliotropic brain extensions made for the afterlife. You know, your poetry. When will you let your mouth become the gap between the pizza crust and the cheese? When will the earth become a ping pong ball sized pupil bopping past the forest of liquid gold yolk filled solo cups and into the firmament? You may be a bro, but that doesn't mean your soul can't leak glitter all over the baseball diamond. You may be a guy, but that doesn't mean your liver doesn't wear a pink feather beret, that your id isn't draped in metallic negligee. If inside each suburb is an identical suburb where McMansions hide teeming cities within, then when will your living room explode into grimy kaleidoscopic subways and to crack beakers full of the ashes of interplanetary love affairs? In bro realism, None of us know shit, and this is the shit. Even if the moonlight is made of cell phone flashlights, even if the closet full of broken telescope top hats is covered by a rack of faded beer label caps, even if your vocabulary is shrinking into atomic subparticles, please put, put down your TV shaped bong. Try opening that hole in your ear. Thank you. Yeah. That's great. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So that, that's that's what it's like to uh, to substitute for <laughs> the last moment. Thank you so much. Uh, so our next reader uh, is going to be Caroline Haygood. 
Caroline is an assistant professor of literature writing and publishing and director of the undergraduate writing uh, of undergraduate writing at St. Francis College in Brooklyn. So yet another of our Brooklyn poets. Uh, she's published two books of poetry, Lunatic Speaks and Making Maxine's Baby, a book length essay, Ways of Looking at a Woman and a novel, uh, which is at this very moment uh, at the uh, at the printer, we hope to have it uh, in a few weeks, Ghosts of America, a lyric novel. Her writing has appeared in the Kenyon Review, the Huffington Post, the Guardian, Salon, and the Economist. So in Ghosts of America, one on one unforgettable night, a sexist male novelist undergoes a peculiar transformation. After being haunted by the ghosts of the women, he is miswritten, Jackie Kennedy and Valerie Solanus. Mary Louise Parker has called Caroline's work profoundly unique and honest, somehow executed with an astonishing lack of ego. She will break your heart with her naked sincerity, a masterful singular writer who sheds light with every page. So I, since we don't, the new book is at the printer right now, I don't have the cover before me, but these are her two, uh, Making Maxine's Baby, the first book from Hanging Loose and Ways of Looking at a Woman, the extended essay, uh, which came out just a few years ago. Uh, so Caroline, take it away. Thank you so much, Mark. Thank you to all of you for organizing. Um, it's such an honor to be reading with the women of Hanging Loose. Um, as Mark has pointed out, there's been many women of Hanging Loose who are astounding. Um, and there are some you know, I mean, Joanna, I don't even, Joan, you heard them, right? It's, it's incredible. Um, and I'm actually going to start, um, and thank you to you for being here today. I think my mom is even here, but potentially she's very committed. Um, thank you for that. Um, I'm going to start by reading a poem from Carrie Smith, who couldn't be here today, another amazing poet. Um, and just about the most lyrical um, bartender that that ever will serve you, right? Like, anyway. <laughs> but don't mess um, with her. Don't mess with her. She carries a bat behind the bar. She is. She is. And she's. And she. Well, I'm about to show you what she can do with her poetry. Um, and here in this poem, she mentions Bob Hershon, who is um, an editor of Hanging Loose that we did lose this year. Uh, and so I also wanted to um, read this poem as well for that reason. So it's called, You Know What They Say About April. My friend died the same day a baby was born. It's raining and the daffodils in the yard are blooming. The roses are struggling. I'm biding my time for the cherry blossoms. It's spring 2021 and you know what they say about April. It's spring, I say, with every footstep clomping down on the sidewalk. Spring, spring, spring. Please don't interrupt me. My sober days are split with the news of the dying. So I end up drinking the end of the maple syrup. Cheers to you, Ruby. Cheers to you, Bob. And yes, I'll gladly see the photo of your infant daughter. Time isn't stopping and neither am I. <laughs> so, I mean, you can see, you can see why we were sad that she wasn't here. And you can also see why we were thrilled that Joanna would be able to be here, right? You can see both. And now they're both here in a way because we've read some of her poems. Um, because I was trying to fit with the more poetic, um, the poets of tonight, I'm gonna read from the lyric essay. Um, and also I don't have the book yet of the other one. Um, so ways of looking at a woman, uh, I started writing it at the same time that I was supposed to be writing a dissertation. Um, so it would be open on my, you know, Microsoft Word at the same time. Um, so it playfully has some of the titles of dissertation parts, like the first part is research proposal. Um, but instead of being, a dissertation, it, you know, I was pregnant at the time I was writing it. So I was making a baby, I was making a book and this kind of twisted in my mind in a very strange way. And it, and I made this, I created this very strange book um, instead of my dissertation. No, my dissertation did get finished 
Um, but I feel like I couldn't have finished it without writing this at the same time, if that makes any sense, because this is where I could misbehave. Um, whereas with the dissertation I had to, I felt behave. Um, okay, so the first section is called research proposal. It electrocutes me in the best possible way to watch the thoughts marching from afar like a terrifying army. What is this sick compulsion to shatter the celluloid that encases me, write my way out with a lyric essay, to pervade, project light through light, wrap my head around what I am, a movie in the shape of a woman, seeing and being seen, writer mother, a mixed genre, a person with another person growing inside her. And what will happen if I can't? Will my skin curl, crack and harden till I'm mummified, bundled beetle-like in my own ambition? If only someone had told me early on, you will never get the orange peel off in one clean spiral, but more haunting shapes will come out of it in the end. Okay, and so this is a few pages later in that same section. It blows my mind that we're just bundles of science that somehow gained consciousness. When I feel overcome by my post-birth transformation, I imagine my body as a written form and try to guess its genre. I decide it's an essay, but probably a lyric essay. I wanna be able to catalog it so I can keep it ideologically under control. I think this still involves the Dewey Decimal System, but I'll have to ask my local librarian. It's easy to picture the structure of my essay body as following a linear pattern so that my head is either the introduction or conclusion, but what of other ways of imagining the body's structure? And then the rest of the essay is kind of the answer to that. <laughs> Um, this is from one of the later sections. It's called literature review. Um, if you've ever had to write something like this, a piece of writing like this, you'll feel the pain of the literature review. It's awful. <laughs> um, it's wonderful, obviously, because you're reviewing all the literature, but it's awful because you're reviewing all the literature. Um, and so this is, this is that section in this book. And all this brings me to my own fierce mother, a force who lives inside me as I once lived inside her, a concept I'm unable to get over. Her body was my first home, my first haunted house. Then I think of the feeling of her when she hugs me, skin and bones, yet so much force to those hugs, like a tiny determined bird has gotten a hold of you, and this bird loves you, but it hurts a bit. And you wonder how on earth this bird ever got to be so strong, if it will ever let go, if you even want it to. And so my mom lives inside me in a nice Victorian apartment, her own little haunted flat in my inner city. I would say house, but that's not really her style. She's in there right now, padding around, making coffee. She always is. It's something I can't do anything about. But I would often choose not to evict her because I stand a little straighter this way, a little stronger, knowing we can handle whatever comes up together. I'm willingly haunted by my mother. When I was a child, my mom told me something that was morbid, but also incredibly comforting. She said, Whenever I was away from her, even after she died, I could look at the moon and she'd be in there looking back at me. I thought about this on night car rides as that rock ribbed, indefatigable moon, its own kind of monster stalked us always. I thought too of the Frankenstein creature pursued by his male mother to the ends of the earth. As I teach, and take care of my kids each day, I carry my mom inside me. And I have to use all my adult know-how 
not to try to crawl back inside her on the days we hang out. But what am I looking for? What am I trying to travel back in time and space towards exactly? Why do I sometimes feel lonely when I'm surrounded by people? Am I secretly sad nobody can climb inside me? Except my children, of course. And you know what? The only time in my life I didn't feel that loneliness was while pregnant because I literally had someone inside me haunting me. At night, when my son's afraid of monsters or when he needs to leave me and he doesn't feel able, I tell him I'm always in his heart. But he takes me at my word as though I've actually taken up residence in that organ of his. Before he disappears into preschool, he pinches his chest with alarming vigor and tells me, live right here, mama, all the time. And this seems to give him courage to trot on inside. But how does this not scare the hell out of him? I want to be able to tie myself to him like a talisman, have him never feel alone and unguarded out there in that battlefield that is our life some days. But of course, this is impossible in any real dimension. I want to be a teddy bear he can old hold inside him always. I find this particularly poignant since he picked out my outfit the other day and included a teddy bear for me to wear. I think perhaps he was trying to hitch a ride on my body, to be always in my heart, to haunt me right back. I loved it. I only didn't wear the teddy bear because I couldn't figure out the logistics. Then it hits me. The, monster, the monstrous is largely a question of degree. This is at least part of why I've always identified with monsters. When I love someone, I wanna burrow into their heart, live in that blood moon, and this is too much. I have always been too much. It's like my calling card. It's practically a profession since people like me also tend to be largely unemployable, at least in any traditional sense. Nobody wants to pay me to write odes to gory lunar landscapes, or at least not enough to live on. At night, my son asks for a special, extra long lasting hug, and we hold on to each other for what feels like forever. He often says it then, you're in my heart, and I say, yes, yes, picturing actually voyaging into my son's life-giving organ, making a home there. Then one night he asked to hear my heart, and I don't even know where he learned about the whole procedure of this. I don't ask because I don't wanna break the magic spell that's fallen over us. I maneuver him so he can put his head to my chest. He lies there for a little, then asks if I wanna hear his heart. And I see no other answer, but yes, and I do so much. I put my head to his little chest. He's warm and smells like fruit juice. His body feels so much smaller than I think it will, just like my mother's always does. This sound, this feeling, how to even speak of it. I expect to hear something like a bang, 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 but it has layers just like him, just like me, just like this book. It's more like a little gurgling metronome. And I see that he's my little gurgling metronome. As I rest my head there on his heart, I hear the story of everything. I realize in this moment that I've continued this tradition of maternal haunting. With all this business of living in the heart, am I insisting on haunting my own child as my mother has always haunted me? Can there be a good form of haunting though? Is it called love? Thank you so much. Thank you. That's great. Thank you, Carolyn. Wow. And uh, I want to recommend to everybody Ghosts of America, which will be out in the fall. Uh, it's, uh, it's a tour de force. <laughs> That's all I can say. And you won't be disappointed. So my pleasure now to introduce Linda Norton. Uh, who's the author of Whiteout, Love and Work, uh, which was published by our press uh, last year. It's a memoir with poems, and, it's, and uh, she has a prequel, The Public Gardens, Poems and History, uh, that came out from Crest Wafer 
in 2011, which was a finalist uh, for the Los Angeles Times Book Prize. Both books were uh, small press bestsellers and uh, certainly Whiteout keeps selling very strongly. Born in Boston, Linda uh, has lived in Brooklyn for many years before moving to Oakland, where she raised her daughter and met her foster son, who are the heart and soul of Whiteout, a book that John Keynes calls a masterpiece and Norman Fisher calls a gorgeous, courageous book. E. Scott Miller calls Whiteout a must for anyone trying to understand the nuanced aggression of systematic oppression and how it affects the afflictor and the afflicted in equal measure. A pleasure to introduce you to Linda Norton. Linda. Hi, everybody. So good to be with, with the women of Hanging Loose um, and Mark and Dick and um, Donna in spirit, because she was, I guess, the person who discovered some of my poems long ago in the slush pile and uh, the memory of Bob Hershon. And I'm struck by um, the tone of Hanging Loose Press Poets, which is everything in the world, but funny for sure. Um, I like that. Um, I'm going to read, um, I'll, I'll hold up my book. So Whiteout is here, Public Gardens is here. Um, and they're both, even though that first book was a finalist for an LA Times Book Prize in Poetry, it was half prose. And Whiteout is 80% prose. Um, and I have a hard time calling myself a poet, but uh, I do seem to write them. So I'm gonna read something um, that I wrote. It's not in either book uh, in response to John Keane's. John Keane is, a, if you know him, a terrific uh, writer, uh, wrote the book Counter Narratives from New Directions. He's a poet, he's a translator and just an all around fine person. And he has these emotional outreach exercises. So I decided to do one and then he posted it on his blog. So here it is. Um, Song of Myself, filmmaker, star, a doctor examining the culture, me on a walk. On the pavement, I noticed an electric blue post-it from that batch I stole when I quit my job. Taylor, Negritude, Milk and You, my dirty to-do list. I must have walked this way last week and dropped it. In December sun, I hurry past the cathedral like it might get me. And then I saunter, Thoreau-like, saunter in California. And again, I'm everything. The spinsters Thoreau disparaged, the turtles he saw copulating and tried to separate, the mother who saves him from civilization, open to alms. My loneliness is like a poem by Fanny. By this time, my parka is off. In the co-op bakery, when I get to the counter, the cashier is dazzled for a minute. You look like Elizabeth Taylor, but then he wonders if he's right not to offer me the senior discount yet. That's right, I say, not yet. Well, I wrote that four years ago, so I'm, I'm right on the edge of, of the discount. Um, I'm reading this at the suggestion of my friend Janet. Uh, and you'll see that um, in a way it's my land acknowledgement. Uh, I now am, am speaking to you from Ohlone land in unceded territory in California. Stain, Salada, Lipton, Red Rose, Dregs stain the paper, the color of the Wampanoag, the parchment in the museum where you learned a little about Indians. Wessagusset, now that's a beautiful word. The first printing of a Bible in the colonies was a translation into Massachusetts. Who now reads Massachusetts? We were sunning at Nantasket after mass in situate and a lunch of iced tea and sandwiches. We stretched out on the jetty and put clamshells over our eyelids. I have a Polaroid of us smiling brown, white bassinet in the foreground. So you could say uh, like other things we've heard today, but especially the, the poem by Carrie, um, 
there's a baby in there and there's also death because um, two of the people in that picture, my brother Joseph and our friend Paul um, died of AIDS early in the epidemic. And uh, Joseph's life is a big part of both of my books. I wasn't going to read any prose, but Caroline read her so beautifully. Um, sometimes it can be poetry. September 2001, the books are both in the form of, of journals and diaries interspersed with poems. And thank you to Dick at Hanging Loose for helping me figure out how I might do that better. Um, I, uh, I am a Bostonian I, and I am a Brooklynite too, that books both contain so many references to Brooklyn. So I'm really especially happy today to be with New Yorkers. September, 2001, we were so early for the flight, I detoured and stopped in the North End to show Isabel the places where we used to take Nani to buy her yeast and her grain alcohol and the flavoring for the anisette. I showed her Paul Revere's church and the old Sicilians eating pastry in the bakeries. We stood in the doorway of a pork store and inhaled the smell of the ancient wooden floor the spices, the salami and the Parmesan. And then I went to Logan, we went to Logan to catch our flight. Only the desperate go to East Boston, Wieners wrote. From here, I could almost see the tenement where my mother was born. I looked down as we swooped over the South shore. I was leaving the 18th, 19th and 20th centuries for good. A flight attendant, tall and blonde, brought a warm business class cookie for Isabel. And though it was not yet noon, he brought a glass of wine for me. The good stuff, the red they serve in first class in a real glass for free. It's too early, I said, but I guess he could see I was having a bad day. It's cocktail, cocktail hour somewhere, dear. He was so sweet. I could easily imagine what he looked like in his fourth grade school photo, hair parted carefully and greased back, a few missing teeth. I gave Isabel a pad of paper and a pen. She asked me how to spell beauty and joy. I wrote them down for her. Then she proceeded to write the beauty of the joy on every page of the pad. Getting off the plane in San Francisco, I breathed in the smell of fog and eucalyptus. What was I coming home to? Difficulties, but better difficulties than the ones I'd left behind. Um, Jiwan and I have read together and um, she read some parts of, or asked me to read certain parts of my book and um, they're very difficult parts and that, that was good for me to have to do that. Um, and this section is about the last time I saw my parents who are both still alive and that was 20 years ago. And I guess part of the reason I write my books is because I feel like my life is often a case of mistaken identity. So it's kind of busting out the, the truth and doing some shame busting. I hope. September 11th, in the pharmacy, collective sadness, silence, except for an autistic boy who's waiting for his grandfather, for his grandfather for a prescription. The boy is screaming and crying. The old man is holding him tightly and tenderly. No one looks right at him, nor does anyone move away from him. Isabel's poems. Janet asked me to read my daughter's poems. Uh, my son is an important character in this book also. Mom, this living creature walks around the house not knowing what to do. Isabel, this wonderful creature walks around the house throwing back her pearls. 2004, Isabel wrote a poem after Lynn Huginian's poetry reading last night. A pink irony fills the alphabet. Tame wild rice, three word irony. She was about nine, you know, when they start to learn about irony. Two more poems from Isabel. She used a spell from her book of spells to make these. In a hope that the relatively easy exhaustion, it's the daily buzz, romantic Jill Scott, sacrifice the things. And Southeast Asia, you've changed. Isabel is at a class sleepover at the Sands house. Um, I'm reading this in memory of Bill Corbett and for the, for the Boston fellows here. Red Sox. They are watching the World Series and running in and out of the house to witness the eclipse. 
I want the Red Sox to win for my father, whatever he has done or not done, he's old and he's waited a lifetime for this. I'm sitting in Lucas watching the game, remembering the World Series in 1986, happening as Joey was dying. In the bar, pandemonium as the Red Sox win and people are congratulating me because I come from Boston. I laugh and lapse into my accent. I don't even think about it. I just dial home. My father picks right up. For a minute, it doesn't matter that we haven't spoken for years. Jesus, he says, it's like a miracle. All my kids are calling me. I think even Joey tried to call, but we had a bad connection. Joey was my brother who died. Um, this is uh, another poem Janet suggested I read. And it's called My Mary. Uh, all the lines in this are, except the title, are from the Book of Job, I think. Does the rain have a mother? Who made the drops of dew? Out of whose womb came the ice? She is hardened against her young ones as though they were not hers. The face of the deep is frozen. Um, and then, Two, uh, two line poems. The first one, Feminine, is from Whiteout, and the second one, Self-Portrait with a Grudge, is from the Public Gardens. Feminine. Last night, when I said I was king, he pulled me closer. Self-Portrait with a Grudge. Bow down your ear, O Lord, hear me, for I am poor and needy, Psalm 86. He took everything, though I gave him so much more. And then um, I was going to read this at a, at a reading at the Woodbury Room at Harvard, but then I noticed that the guy this poem is about was at the Zoom reading. And I didn't, I was so flummoxed by that, so I skipped it. But here you go. Um, it's called In My Girlish Na Days, which is a Memphis mini song. And it starts with an um, epigraph that's from a little news story. The epigraph is almost as long as the short poem. It took the eight-year-old female shark 21 hours to eat the five-year-old male inside a tank at the aquarium. According to video of the consumption, the female shark started with the male's head and slowly went about consuming the rest of his body. This act of shark cannibalism likely was the result of the sharks bumping into one another. Sharks have their own territory, as an aquarium official told writers. Sometimes when they bump into each other, they bite out of astonishment. 21 hours? I would have made a meal of him in the time it takes to listen to every song on Sinatra's In the Wee Small Hours, the greatest breakup album of all time. But then I'd spend the rest of my life feeling terrible about it. I'm sorry, dear, you astonished me, so I ate you. I eat men like air or something. And of course, that's, that's for Sylvia Plath. I mention her in the prose section, how, you know, when I was starting to secretly write poems, I was in Boston and seeing like Sylvia Plath and Ian Sexton, you know, you kind of had to kill yourself if you were uh, a female poet and, you know, you couldn't do that if you were going to have kids. So, well, anyway, some of us have figured out a way to stay alive and write poems and have kids. All right, the last one is from um, the Public Gardens, and it's called Self Portrait as a Meadow. There is a chair, the heart of which is wooden split five ways, and grass pressed where we kissed, where others later kissed on the same mattress, and solemn nothing happening under a canopy. Have you forgotten me? I will go down wonderfully, as was told in Proverbs, though for a long time I thought I should not go. Here are things that have no Latin names or none that men would know. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you, thank you, Linda. Uh, Mark, uh, would you like to ask any questions or? Well, you know, I was thinking that um, one of the sort of recent traditions, actually, G1 sort of uh, got this idea going of having poets in conversation. 
uh, uh, is an idea she had for Hanging Loose Poets. And since we have four Hanging Loose authors here, um, you know, to get them to talk a little bit to one another about uh, what they, the, perhaps some commonalities they, they, they see in, in one another's work or, you know, inspirations they find in one another's work that uh, would be, it would be nice to hear that kind of dialogue going on. Here. Absolutely, absolutely. Would you like to kick off or? Or shall I, shall I just shoot out a question? Well, I was thinking, you know, so Caroline and, and Linda, uh, both who are sharing some prose with us here, um, and, you know, both really amazingly innovative, uh, you know, and, and, and uh, unusual prose forms, I mean, really creative prose forms that they're, uh, you know, Linda, Linda blending uh, poetry uh, and, and kind of di uh, journals and, and Caroline <laughs> sitting there trying to write her dissertation <laughs> and, and trying to save herself, uh, uh, her creative self. Uh, I, mean, I think it's, uh, you know, the idea of uh, preserving one's poetic sensibility and creativity uh, while struggling with, uh, with life and, and careers and uh, family, et cetera, uh, you, got, you two have really you know, been pretty inventive. Uh, and I wonder if you, you see any similarities or echoes within each other's work. So that would be a place to start perhaps. One comment that Linda just made that certainly resonated with me is this idea of being a woman poet slash writer, right? You know, prose writer, whatever it is, poetic writer, and, you know, but not being Sylvia Plath, um, you know, but living and having a family. So, but, so writing, but still living, still having a family. <laughs> um, and that whole equation um, I thought was interesting because I have found it to be a, a question of survival in some, in some ways. Um, and like certainly the, the question that's gone on for many years about, you know, how many children can a woman have, a woman writer have and still be able to write and it's, is it one, is it two, um, don't have any, no, just don't have more than one, like I've read all these articles. Um, and so I, I thought that was an interesting statement that you made. Yeah, I have Caroline's book here, but I haven't read it yet. Um, but. Uh, now when I do read it, I'll hear it in her voice, which I love. Um, yeah, I, I, um, I am really foregrounding women and girls in my book, but also my son, my brothers. Um, but I was a single mother raising one daughter for a long time. My son came into my life through the the foster care system when he was 17. And um, I really guarded my, my priority of myself and my daughter. Um, and I think that comes through very much in the writing. Um, yeah. And uh, what else? I mean, daily writing in my notebooks, which I didn't know was actually going to yield books. I didn't publish a book until I was 50, um, has been a revelation. And it's when students read my books in classes, I've learned to, there's a lot of shocking stuff in my books. And actually Dick, I guess, read the press release for my book and I, I found the use of one word really shocking. He talked about how I talk about my lovers and I was thinking, I don't have any lovers. And then, <laughs> and I remembered my brother before he died, he was archly telling me that that was an awful word and you could never tell if your lover was loving you. You only knew if you were loving them. So you should call them your beloveds. <laughs> um, but yes, there are some lovers in there and um, I think uh, prose gives me the chance to kind of work through the narrative there and the growth of 
not just myself, but quite a few other individuals in the, in the lifespan of the, the book. You know, the, uh, the idea of, uh, I mean, the journal has become uh, a principal form uh, of writing for me as well. Uh, you know, and, and I, I've been inspired by, you know, the example of uh, the Japanese poetic journal, you know, going, going back to Basho, uh, you know, interspersing, you know, prose, prose and kind of, uh, kind of poetic epiphanies. And, and clearly you do that a lot, Linda. Um, and the, uh, you know, and, and, and I had that same kind of revelation, I think there were times when uh, my, 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 my second son was, you know, very little and, and demanding a lot of, a lot of my time when I, when I, I just felt like I just couldn't write. Mm -hmm. I, just, I was too distracted, but I was writing journals and I later went back to them and, found, and discovered that I could, you know, that I had material that I could go back to and use. And so that was really mm -hmm. a wonderful resource. I think the other thing I would say about the idea of, uh, I'm, I'm just thinking about Sexton and Plath, uh, you know, and having just finished my memoir about Denise Levertov, I mean, she very controversially wrote an essay uh, on the occasion of Sexton's death. Uh, and published it in the uh, Boston Real Paper, uh, I think, uh, and got a lot of uh, negative feedback over it because, you know, what she basically said, you know, she was against, you know, this sort of whole romanticization of the poet and the, the poet and the poet's suicide, and uh, and uh, you know, and really thought we should be looking to examples of writers who have sustained, you know, who have sustained their their creativity uh, into into old age, and mm -hmm. so it's a it's a wonderful essay. Mm -hmm. uh, Light up the cave is what it's called, as I recall. Yeah, I just want to say also um, that the women writers who weren't mothers are also all over my book, and uh, I'm actually glad that my daughter can grow up to have children or not and be a, a complete person. So Joanna and Jiwan, any anything anything to uh, conversations that to 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 longtime Brooklyn poets here. Uh, I did mention in this in the vein of Bogan and Plath. I also um, I draw a lot of energy from Louise Bogan, uh, who also had her own uh, issues with. Uh, her fame, not fame, um, and I, I find her to be a very compelling figure and her childhood experiences obviously really, um, as with, you know, many of us writers, her childhood really uh, seeped into um, how, she, how she wrote and I think how she uh, looked at herself as a, as a writer. Um, and I look at her not as a woman writer, but as a writer, because she is really spectacular and fine. Um, and probably, you know, underrated, you know, to, to an extent. Um, but I, I do find a lot of interesting parallels, you know, between Sexton, Plath and Bogan and just how they, not that they lived in the same time, but just, yes, the, the grappling with with your profession and you know as like Caroline is talking about like having children how and how do you juggle that or even if you don't have children you know maybe you're taking care of other things right mm -hmm. um because we all are uh, but I think women are often tasked with uh burdens um that we either take on or that are foisted upon us so um it, I, but I, I think it's an interesting lens to, you know, to keep looking through. I mean, I think that the reason when I was young, like a teenager, I was attracted to the New York school as opposed to like Plath and Sexton. I mean, I like, I mean, obviously they're good poets, but I just was never that, I mean, not that into them. Um, was because I felt like there was more of a chance of having a life in the New York school. Like I even like, I remember when I was young and reading Ashbury, there was just a dailiness, like a fun to it. Like, mm -hmm. hey, we're just like having a coffee and we have like a personality. Not everything is like lyric intensity all the time. Um, 
so I think that that's something that's just always been true to my aesthetics and poetics. Like I'm not particularly interested in like lyric intensity as a primary mode. Like it's okay sometimes, <laughs> but but in general, I'm more interested in like a variety of tones and experiences and humor. You know, I mean, that's what's so great about Hanging Loose. I think that I think that question of humor is really interesting. Um, as somebody who loves lyric intensity but can't sustain it for that long without making some kind of I don't want to say a joke, but like in my personal in my life and in my writing, and I, and I do think that Hanging Loose embraces um, right. humor, not like joke telling, but 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 the little wit, the wryness, something that tone a lot more than a lot of poetry and presses and magazines do. And I think it's an interesting question of, of the role of humor in, you know, and, and what its relationship is to lyric intensity. And, and I think it's also related to how you see the role of the poet. I mean, the sort of Orphic tradition of the suffering poet is, is a little bit boring, like whether you're a man or, or a woman, you know, and I think it's interesting how many of the poets mm -hmm. Hanging Loose publishes like Juwan and Mark and Bob were not teaching poets they were doing other things they were you know and dick like they they found a way to be a, to make a living that wasn't poetry and i actually do teach poetry but like i think it's important to just foreground the dailiness of life and not think about the sort of poet as just a poet and but joanne i'm just uh, i'm just thinking of your uh, i was it was a, a delight to uh, hear you read uh, the the sonnet sequence Referring to Muriel Rukeyser, who, who, uh, who, who was very dear to my heart, uh, but you know, very political and very uh, engage, uh, engaged. I mean, uh, you know, uh, and a model in many ways for. Uh, I, I know she was a, a an inspiration to like uh, Levertov to. Uh, to other uh, poets who are a little bit younger than her, you know, in their political engagement, and uh, and and so it was it was really interesting. It seems that uh, there's a a bit of a resurgence of interest in in Muriel's work, which is very welcome, I think. And I was, I was I'm curious to hear, uh, in addition to that poem, what you know how. Have you been reading her all along? Has uh, did oh, suddenly she actually appears in Moraine too? Well, that's right. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, I've been reading her since I was yeah. young, like in my early twenties. But um, yeah, I mean, and, and I think I just hear her voice in my head sometimes. You know, mm. I don't think I know her work as well as you know I might know some like New York school people's work because mm. yeah. it's I don't know I just. Well, it was very varied. I mean, I think, you know, she had a lot of uh, early doc, you know, kind of political documentary poetry. Uh, her later work was a lot more lyrical, uh, I think. And, yeah. and she also embraced her sexuality more explicitly in the later work. Yeah. I do have to just counter in oh. terms of intensity. Yes, I, I definitely admire the lyric intensity aspect of, uh, of certain writers. But I think for me, I really draw power and energy just from um, the experiences, you know, of these poets that I read, um, because I know that their experiences have really flowed into and is embodied by their work, uh, whether it's Philip Levine, you know, whether it's uh, Kumanyaka. I mean, I really, I think for me, as much as I admire um, the poetry, I also really am very fascinated you know just how people um live their lives and how these experiences really um embody their work and i think about myself you know in in that aspect as well you know um and i think that's why i write the way that i do um and we were just talking to a lot of people at the brooklyn flea and you know a lot of a lot of the conversations really tend to um i guess bring up the idea of process, you know, and how process and product have to be balanced and one really can't override the other, although sometimes that happens. Um, so that's, I think, where I tend to sort of um, 
you know what I tend to look at when I look at a poet. I mean, I also look at the intensity of the experiences. And I think that's why White Out for me was such kind of an inspirational model for that. The, the straddling of prose and poetry and the really the weaving back and forth really, um, I don't know, it, it just kind of taught me something that I wasn't uh, thinking about, you know, before I read, before I read Linda's book. Well, you know, I think uh, the, 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 the process versus product in some ways uh, is a false dichotomy. Uh, and, and, and people who, well, that's it. That's, that's what I'll say. <laughs> I think it's a false dichotomy. But speaking of process, I love what Linda said about not even realizing that she was writing the things that would become the books. Yeah. And this discussion about, you know, you know, you're writing it on little scraps, you're writing it on your iPhone or your voice dictating it, like whatever it is. And, and also in connection with, you don't have to have kids to have a busy life and have so many, as Juwan was saying, like so many, you know, wait, so, so many things pulling on your time. And so I love this idea of the way that writers find time to work and the way that you're producing these things that don't even feel like all of my things that I've ended up publishing have been the things I was doing in addition to the other thing I was trying to publish, um, you know, the things that felt like marginalia and that's what's become the main thing every time. And the main thing was never important. Like the main thing I thought I was working on. So I, I think it's, I, I love talking to people about their process and hearing about their little scraps of paper and their note, note section of their iPhone and how their work came to be. Um, if anybody, if any of the writers today or anybody wants to share about how they create their writing. I do want to say that um, I started to say it and then I got distracted. So when I go to classes and they're reading my book, I've noticed that young people will say, how could you say that? Or, you know, did it, did, was it exactly like this in your notebook? Of course it wasn't. It was, it was it's a made thing, um, especially the second book. Um, but I've taken to bringing photocopies of pages from my actual notebook to show them how messy it is. You know, it doesn't jump out of the notebook into a real book. And I've also told two or three anecdotes that were too horrific to include in my books because I'm writing about other people. So I wanted to talk about the ethics of that and the decisions and, you know, so on. So I think at least for the kind of writing I do that, that's, I remember reading Eudora Welty's One Writer's Beginnings and wishing I had her life. <laughs> this filled with love. Well, you, you work with what, you work with the dirt you got, as August Wilson said. I remember the, uh, <clears throat> I had the, the great pleasure to befriend Meridol Lassur uh, after she was kind of rediscovered in the late 60s, early 70s, and she became a friend. I was actually editing, uh, helping edit West End Press at the time, which published her work. And Meridal, you know, who grew up in a socialist family in the 30s, and then was, uh, you know, her, uh, ran, off, ran off to, uh, ran away from her family to Hollywood, where she was a stunt woman in the 1920s in the silent films, and then lived in Emma Goldman's commune in, in New York, where she used to tell stories about uh, a Dreiser coming to this, uh, the Sunday salon and chasing her around the table. Uh, and she, you know, and, and Meridol, you know, was very involved in early labor, you know, labor struggles in the Midwest and in the thirties. Uh, but she was uh, an, an a prolific writer, uh, a best-selling writer in the thirties, blacklisted. She just kept writing and she used to say, you know what I do? I, when I put the kids to bed, I put my head under the, under the cold water faucet and then I write until I fall asleep. And, you know, she produced about 40 books. Uh, so, you know, one, one, find, one finds a way. Uh, That's process, Mark. <laughs> my process right there, right yeah, there. Yeah, process right there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was, I was just thinking. It doesn't have a lot of time. I, I think about process a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I was just Cold thinking about what, what, 
I was, I was, I was thinking about what uh, what Linda said about the the difference between uh, taking you know taking the 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 actual journal to class and the and the written mm -hmm. product, and I'm thinking thinking that uh, you know most of us in in this last I don't know more than half century of of poetry developing as you know and a lot of us um, write poetry so that it sounds like and reads like somebody is talking to you so you know it reads like conversation very often and it's sometimes hard for other people to understand no, it's not really conversation. It took hours and hours of work to make it sound like conversation. Mm -hmm. So there's that confusion there, I think. That and if you want an editor to help you make it sound like conversation, then you got to go to Dick Lurie, <laughs> a great editor. Well, thank you, guys. This, this has been wonderful. Um, well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mark thank and, you, and, uh, and Jonathan, for hosting this. Uh, it's been a great conversation and uh, yeah. good. Thank Absolutely. You. Thank you, Hanging Loose. Thank you, Lit Bomb. Terrific. Uh, Thank you. And now, um, after this wonderful reading, we're, we're going to move on to the open mic section of Lit Bomb, uh, which Jonathan is curating today. All right. So we've only had one person sign up in advance for the open mic, which is um, Bob Heeman. Um, if anybody else would like to go real quick, you know, um, just hit us up in the chat and we can run a few people. And if not tonight, we can run you on the 28th. Um, Bob, do you have a poem for us tonight? I think he's muted. Yeah, Bob, you're still muted. You should be able to unmute yourself. There we go. Sorry about that. No problem. Okay. Um, this was actually published in Hanging Loose 40 years ago. And it's quite <laughs> different from what I'm doing now. But music. There is no song at all that can carry the ball the way you do. I can't understand how the bloody red hand works its voodoo. It moves in the air, making circles and squares and curved lines. The clouds move away, and all through the day I feel fine. And then it is night, and a terrible fright starts to grow. A breeze moves the leaves, and a terrible wind starts to blow. And although it is August, it feels like it's 20 below. And out on the lake, a dead man is starting to row. He's coming for us, there's no doubt at all in our minds. He's moldy and old and looks like he's probably blind. He stumbles and crawls up onto the bank. He moves straight ahead, his face, it is blank and uncaring. He's a man who could stand at the edge of the sand without staring. Thank you, Bob. Yeah, Thank I can you. see why they published that. That was excellent. I think that was before my time. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. We'd like to hear from John Wessick. John? Wow. Okay. Here's the other uh, surreal thing I was thinking of uh, contributing. It's called Another Day in Paradise. Dawn's first rays of uncertainty paint zebra stripes on my wall. I try to sleep, but the neighing keeps me awake. Chased by logic, my dreams gallop away. El Nino brings sea level to my doorstep. I know I should move, but where else can I get a studio apartment for $3,000 a month? Falco, the landlord, waves. I reel in the morning paper. Headline TV's Little Ricky guns down 50 on West Bank. An investigative reporter chased rumors of Puxeltani Phil now lives with Lobster Boy in an abandoned refrigerator in Florida. He photographed the couple dancing and drinking Cuba Libres in a Miami nightclub. My watch melts, I have to leave. Einstein's ghost fiddles with flashlights and rulers by the train station. No one pays him any mind until I offer to help. 
Activists pelt us with charcoal briquettes who were once Japanese babies. He'll kill again, they scream, unless he's stopped. Officer McNulty books him on an 815 and tells me to move along. I catch the 738 southbound to my job in Tijuana and spend the day giving celebrities tobacco enemas. A customs agent sniffs my shoes on the way home. He wants to check my underwear too, so I slip him a few pesos to change his mind. A virgin stripper in knee socks loiters outside a coffee shop where writers compare rejection slips. I tell her about today's movie star client. I know him too. She gives me a discount lap dance and subjects me to a roller coaster of menstrual emotions and look till 2 a.m. My ear throbs against the pillow. I can't sleep. At least the zebras are quiet. Thanks, John. That was great fun. I think we'll all wind up in an abandoned refrigerator soon enough. <laughs> all right, I think that's it for tonight. Mark, would you like to close us out? Yes, yeah. absolutely. Um, thank you. Thank you once again, Hanging Loose. Thank you, Dick. Thank you, Mark. Uh, thank you, Juwan, for initiating this whole affair. Yeah, thank, uh, you. thank you, Linda, Caroline, and Joanna. It's been a wonderful night. Um, next time we see you, uh, it will be August 28th, and it will be a kind of special show. It's going to be called Poetry Pirates. Um, a few of our old friends will be there, um, but do come. And our mimetes, thanks for lip balm. Have a great, have a great one. Love, poetry, and health. Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks. Good night, everybody. Night. Bye. 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 Bye.